Oh, I think it's a long, long time ago. I'm not sure I was very realistic about it, but the idea of being a scientist, I guess when I was about 13, and uh, I read, and many of us in, the, in my generation did read Microbe Hunters by Paul de Cruyff, and uh, I just felt that science was a wonderful thing to be in. But my notion was that I was going to be a lab technician. And then when I was a student at the University of Toronto in science course, I had a summer research. And um, I, I came on for the summer as a technician. And the technicians ate lunch down in the basement. And the scientists ate lunch upstairs in a dining room served by waitresses and I decided at that moment that I wasn't going to be a technician. <laughs> I was going to be a scientist. As an undergraduate I was um, in the honors uh, physiology course and uh, it had been a toss-up whether I should go to medical school or Take the, um, take the science course. At that time, you could go into medical school directly from high school. And I was accepted to the medical school, but uh, it, was, uh, it was too tempting. I had a lot of scholarships in the, um, in the science track, and uh, it, it was hard financially for my family, so I decided that I would, uh, I would take the science course. And, used my scholarship money to buy my mother her first electric refrigerator. You know, when I was in graduate school, I was one of two graduate students in the physiology department at McGill. So I wouldn't say there were more women or fewer. There weren't many women around. There were more women in psychology, but in uh, biochemistry and physiology, not so many. Um, let's say they tolerated it, and they. Um, uh, I, d I don't. I don't think. I don't think my mother really had a view of me as a career woman. I think she had a view of me as getting married and living in a house together, that, that we would have a, f a family that consisted of her family and my family very close together. And that certainly is not the way it turned out. No, that was the point. The point was to go where no one had gone before. That was, I, I didn't want role models. I didn't, I, it was important for me to feel that I was really going in a direction that was, uh, that was new and that was different. <laughs> I, I, just a few weeks ago, I had an email just out of the blue from somebody who'd been in the class with me as an undergraduate and he felt called upon to say, Bernice, you are not the class beauty. <laughs> and that, that surprised me. I told him that if I thought that honor science was a beauty contest that I would have spent more time in the hair salon. <laughs> No, I just, I did what I did. I, I wasn't, I don't think I was out to prove something. I'm still not. It's, it's somehow doesn't, doesn't seem to matter. No, what impelled me to take the embryology course was that uh, I was I was fairly well known as an as an electrophysiologist. I worked on 
the uh, electrophysiology of the cerebral cortex. And, um, uh, but I got to a point where I felt that I wanted to change tracks. I wanted to go into development. And I didn't know how to get into development and it wasn't, it wasn't at all obvious. Nowadays when you look out there, uh, there are any number of labs involved in development and by the way, a lot of women. It's interesting that it seems to be an area that is attractive to women. To men too, but it's astonishing the, uh, the number of women who have really made outstanding careers. But in those days, there wasn't anybody practically. There wasn't anybody. And so I did, I did two things. In 1960, I went to St. Louis for the summer and met Victor Hamburger and Rita Levy Montalcini. And then in the year after that, I came to do the embryology course here. I had a, I had a colleague at McGill who had worked here and he suggested that I apply to the Grass Foundation f for a fellowship to, to study embryology. And of course, I didn't realize that the Grass Foundation gives fellowships, but not for study, it gives fellowships for research. So I was, uh, uh, I, I, was um, I, I considered it a matter of course, but I'm surprised now that I got a fellowship from the foundation to be a student in the embryology course. And it, but it turned, out, it turned out there were things that I didn't know about at the time, like some of the trustees of the foundation knew who I was because they knew my work from what I'd done before. And uh, so I was uh, what they called their annual frolic. And, um, it was, it was very unusual. It was, I, I don't think they've ever done that since. So there were, there were other fellows of the Grass Foundation that year. One of them was Zach Hall, who went on to a very notable career. Well, it was uh, the embryology course. Everybody was uh, sort of concerned about it because it was clear that it was going to have to change. It had been a very classic kind of embryology, marine embryology, until then. And the, it was an era when people were going around saying, DNA makes RNA makes protein. We were at that stage, but it was clear that things were, things were going to change. We we're going to have to change radically in embryology. Now that was the wonderful thing about Woods Hole. When I came here, when I was, when I was in the course, and we were doing projects and it was, it was a sense of being able to go back, not everybody did, but I did, to go back to the most simple tools, the most direct observation and the least automated, the least mechanized form of doing science. And, and I really felt that I was sort of in touch with the tradition of, of simple science as it had been carried out here to begin with. Now, of course, MBL is as sophisticated as any, as any place else, but, but in those days there was still, for me, the possibility of, of, of being um, just with the most elementary tools being able to do something. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure there are many people who feel that way because science is a, it's, it's a technical pursuit. And some, uh, someone has said that the, what comes first are the techniques, then the ideas. And so the, the technology and, and the incredible opening up of technology now is, is absolutely staggering, but it's very expensive. It's very expensive and it's very collaborative. It's a, you need lots of people. You need lots of people, lots of money, lots of machines. And uh, in, w when I came here for the embryology course, I had the feeling that that was kind of what I was able to get away from.
briefly. Well, it was um, important in terms of meeting uh, people who um, went on and, and, and whom I would have encountered later on as well. Um, did it contribute directly? I'm not sure. It certainly made me have a great affection for the MBL. Um, I'm just trying to think whether it really it really fitted into anything um, that I did. A, a lot of my subsequent career was uh, was made working on fish, but goldfish. But I'm not I'm not sure that comes from Woods Hole. I think that came from other uh, from other things going on in science at the time. Oh, I'm not in research anymore. I'm full-time teaching now. What I'm still full-time, but I'm, I'm teaching. And my research, I guess, has been in, largely speaking, I guess, in, in three areas. One was, as a graduate student, I worked on electrophysiology of the cerebral cortex, and uh, particularly on spreading cortical depression. And then I became interested in development and regeneration. And then the other area was, uh, which was related to that, was on um, axonal transport, movement of materials in, in nerve cells. I did a lot of work with injecting radioactive tracers into the eye and following the movement of radioactive proteins back to the brain. And uh, uh, worked to establish uh, not only rates of transport and movement of materials, but also movement across, uh, across synapses from one nerve cell to another. And uh, the, 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 work, the work has had applications various, uh, of various kinds. And there are several people now here, of course, who are very prominent in that field. And um, uh, one of them is Scott Brady. I was a fellow, and then uh, they were looking for somebody who would join the board of trustees who had been a fellow and who could represent the point of view of the fellows. And I, I, I was the one who got invited to join the board of trustees. Eventually I became a life trustee and now I'm, I'm vice president of the foundation. Well, first of all, it's been uh, from a practical point of view, from a point of view of being familiar with what's going on in science, it's been very useful. And vetting the applications for fellowships, very, very interesting and uh, very illuminating. And uh, so, so that's one aspect. The other aspect, uh, I think, has been that it, it's been an honor. It's been an honor that I think uh, is is important important not to me so much although I enjoy I enjoy being on the foundation and doing the foundation work very much and I enjoy the uh, people that I get to hang out with as a result um, so I think but, but it's it's been it's been very special from that point of view and I must say that uh, knowing Ellen and Albert Grass, who started the foundation, was a very special experience. Yeah. Ellen Grass was was a a, a real a real pioneer for women. Yeah, I mean. She 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 didn't she didn't do research herself, but in encouraging uh, scientists and encouraging research and um, just. Uh, Playing a strong leadership leadership role in the community, I think, very very important. Well, it was um, 
it was a surprise. It was a great surprise when, when they asked me to run for president. I'd been, I'd been treasurer of the foundation in the past, and I was, I was one of the original members, but being asked to be president was, was just came out of the blue. And uh, it, was, uh, it was really great. It was a lot of fun. It was fun being able to, to do things that really made a difference to the, to the society. And uh, one of the things that I did was to start the computerized program. And that, I think, has made a tremendous difference to the society. And, um, oh, and, and, and I rescued the society from, uh, from a real meeting disaster where they, uh, there was a terrible, terrible printing error in the printed program. In those days, of course, there were these big books that went out to everybody. And um, I, I discovered at the last moment when all the programs were already in the mailroom and addressed and ready to be shipped out, I discovered a really disastrous error. They all had to be junked and the whole thing redone again. And uh, it was... Uh, uh, it, you know, not not important, but sort of of significance of that at that moment when it started in uh, uh, when was it about 1970? It started, and uh, there were I think at the beginning there were 600 members, and we sort of knew one another pretty well. We knew certainly a lot of names were familiar, and. Uh, you could still have a cocktail party for all the members of the society. I remember, I think it was the second or third meeting in the uh, botanical garden in St. Louis, of a cocktail party for everybody. Amazing, amazing. 40,000 people now. Not so long ago, I was very impressed, uh, I guess about five years ago, I was very impressed with what the women in neuroscience were doing. They were having uh, these events uh, at the uh, at the Society for Neuroscience meeting, and uh, I, I I somehow came away very uh, very inspired and said I want to do something, and uh, ended up by establishing the award. It's not given to women necessarily, it's given for mentoring of women and there have been several men who have won it. What was the most rewarding moment? I, I worked uh, when I was at McGill, as, as I mentioned, I worked on cortical spreading depression for my PhD thesis. I have never worked on it since, but 50 years after my PhD thesis, I was invited to a meeting as one of the luminaries of the field, and that was, that was really wonderful. That was really great, and apparently that PhD thesis made, made its mark in uh, in its area of science. It became a classic in the Journal of Neurophysiology, yes. Yeah. I don't know, maybe a reflection on the field. <laughs> it hasn't changed enough to be able to dismiss what happened 50 years earlier. 50 years? Who, was, who could even conceive of 50 years? I remember uh, Dr. Burns, my research advisor, asking me, uh, fairly early on, he asked me, where do you think you want to be in 10 years' time? And that absolutely stopped me. I didn't know where I wanted to be in 10 days' time, let alone 10 years' time. And uh, it was, uh, it, it, it really shook me. But I've, I've, never, I've never been thinking in those terms. They've been rewarding in, in very different ways, uh, except for one thing, and that is that they are both really very creative endeavors. You know, you may think of teaching as a kind of routine, you, you know, you go in, you do the same old lecture, but it's really, it's really not like that, especially now with the opening up of all these new 
electronic techniques that you can use and, and the whole idea of, of more uh, proactive role for the students. And uh, so, so I think that, that the amount of creativity that you can put into that is, uh, is enormous. And uh, so, so it's uh, certainly, cer certainly an avenue for creativity as research is.